Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. New power, stronghold power. If I can draw your attention to verse 3, where, uh, uh, where Paul says, yeah, well, though we live in the world, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, Paul says, yeah, well, even though we live in the world, we don't fight like the world. Even though we live in the world, we don't wage war the world the way the world does. The weapons we fight with are not worldly. That They actually are divine. How we battle, how everybody else does it is different than how we do it. How everybody else acts is different than how we act. Actually, the way that we battle, the way that we fight, the weapons that we fight with, they're not the weapons of the world. Actually, on the contrary, they have divine power. They got Holy Ghost power. They have anointed power. They got Jesus power. They got Jehovah God behind me power. They got angels on my side power. The weapons that we fight with have power from on high. Power from heaven. Heavenly power. That's the kind of weapon we fight with. The weapons we fight with have divine power. Anybody know what I'm talking about this morning? Anybody glad that you could say, oh, yeah, I don't fight with regular weapons. The weapons I fight with have divine power. One of the battles, it's, it's one of the things that just, it makes us different. It, it, hey, power, well, Paul is saying, yeah, although we're in the world, although we live in the world, Although we're walking amongst people in the world, although we wear clothes like folk in the world, and we dress like everybody, and we, and we live amongst everybody, at the same time, we're not like everybody else. I'm not like everybody else. Can I get you to just say that? I'm not like everybody else. This is a good confession. I'm not like everybody else. Come on, say it again. I'm not like everybody else. Put your hands on yourself. Say, I'm not like everybody else. Not like everyone else. Tell your neighbor, I'm not like everybody else. I'm not like every other mother in this world. I'm not like every other father in this world. Don't compare me to other people because I'm not like everybody else. Not like them. One of the battles of my childhood. It's one of the battles of childhood. It wasn't just my childhood, but it was one, it's one of the battles of childhood. One of the battles of immaturity, and I'll throw it on the screens for you, is this battle of conformity versus originality. Conformity versus originality. It was a battle my dad had with me. It's a battle I'm having with my sons right now. The, the battle of conformity, conforming and being like everybody else and fitting in, or being different and original and having the courage to not be like everybody else. To say, well, I'm not like everybody else. The world I grew up in, the time I grew up in, Everybody was wearing Adidas. Adidas was what? Run DMC was popular in my day. My Adidas. Everybody was wearing Adidas. Adidas jackets and Adidas on your feet. And Lee jeans got the, the jeans. And it wasn't no Wranglers. I wanted Lee jeans. Dudes wear Lee jeans. And girls wear jeans. Wore Jordache jeans because Jordache jeans had a way of just fitting in that horse on the right spot. First time I met LaShawn, she had on some Jordache jeans. I said, look what the Lord is. That, that, that I wanted to wear Adidas. In my day, I know I'm dating myself, but in my day, dudes used to change. They had fat laces that you put on your, on your Adidas. You wanted some shell-toed Adidas. Shell toed Adidas. That was what and you and you put colored laces on the sneak and and what you did was you changed the laces up to match your outfit. <laughs> and so I I wanted to be like everybody else and my dad just wasn't having it primarily because it cost too much. For me to be like everybody else. It cost too much. He wasn't trying to spend Adidas money. He wasn't trying to spend Lee Jean's money. He was like, well, if you, you can work your job and save your money up and buy yourself some authentic three-stripe shell-toed Adidas. What I'm going to spend my money on is these four-stripe 
fake-looking bobos that look like Adidas and smell like Adidas and fake like they Adidas, but they not Adidas, and you're going to get teased for them. That's what I'm going to spend my money on because they look like sneakers to me, that this battle to be different, this battle to I wanted to be like everybody else. Everybody else had to, had to fade. I wanted to fade. My dad was cutting my hair. He just, he only knew how to do one cut all off. That's all he knew. He'll just cut it all off and give you some kind of fake crooked lineup. My Jesus, my Lord. He's like, that's how I'm going to cut your hair. You want to you wanna get a haircut at a barber shop? Sounds good. Go get a job. Go make your money and pay somebody to give you a fade. Pay somebody to give you a high top. Pay somebody to give you a part that goes, I'll give you a part on the side. But if you want some middle part that goes to the left, like I'll be sure, I know I'm just dating myself. If that's what you want, then you will have to go. You want to look like everybody else, then you'll have to spend your money on that. It's the battle of me trying to conform to the pattern of the world. And him being too cheap to help me do it. But also him just, him also saying to me, why you got to be like everybody else? Why can't you be your original self? Why you got to fit in with everybody else? I think I told the story of how almost all of the schools that I went to, I was raised in Boston, almost all the schools I went to were white schools. When I was in elementary school, I was in a white school. I was uh, maybe the only black kid in my, in my class. Maybe one other black student in my class. And uh, my mom sent me a bunch of pictures the other day. And in the pictures, because she's moving in, and her and my dad bought a new house, and they're moving. And so she sent me all the, in the pictures, in the bag was a picture of me from like the fifth grade. And it was my class picture of everybody in the grade. And I found it kid in the in my class that I wanted to be like his name was Tony Vaccarino I got all the girls like Tony Vaccarino and Tony Vaccarino had this you know white dude Italian boy and he had this way of blowing blowing his his hair out of his face his bang would come down and he would blow it and blow it out the out the way and I I wanted to be like Tony Vaccarino so bad that I started Blowing my back. My dad said, What's what are you doing? I said, Well, I he said, Boy, you ain't your hair sticks straight up. You are, you don't have no Tony Vaccarino bang hanging down for you to blow away. But there's just something about us we want to conform. We want to be like everybody else. We want to dress like everybody else and think like everybody else and act. Like everybody else. <laughs> it's a battle I'm having with my sons right now. I'm, I'm just saying, yeah, but I want you to say I'm not like everybody else. I don't look like everybody else. I don't act like everybody else. Come on, say it again. I'm not like everyone else. I'm different. It's okay with you being different. It's okay with you being original. It's all right for you to not fit in. Say it, I'm not like everyone else. And one of the things that makes you different, I'm prophesying it. One of the things that makes you different is you have an understanding of real power. And one of the things that makes me different, makes you different, is I have stronghold power. Come on, say it. I have stronghold power. I have stronghold power. Yeah. I, I don't know about the rest of this world, but I, me, I've got stronghold power. I have power to demolish strongholds. I have tapped into something in which I know what to do to knock a stronghold out. Strongholds don't scare me. Strongholds don't bother me. I'm not worried about no strongholds. I got power over a stronghold. Weapons I fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have power to demolish a stronghold. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Are you wondering why I'm not like you? Well, it's because the weapons I fight with, my God, I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning. The weapons that I fight with, they're not the weapons of this world. They're not Democratic weapons. They're not Republican weapons. They're not black people weapons. They're not white people weapons. They're not Latino weapons. They're not Asian people weapons. They're not Spanish people weapons. No, no, no. They're not Indian people weapons. No, no, no. The weapons I fight with are not just African or Ghanaian weapons or Nigerian weapons. or They're not Italian weapons. They're not French. The weapons I fight with are not worldly weapons. They actually have divine power. And they can demolish strongholds. What's a stronghold? <laughs> let me just throw, throw just, just, just for all of us who are like, yeah, what's a stronghold? Let me give you just a couple of definitions or just a couple of things, uh, a few pointed characteristics of what actually makes something a physical stronghold because that's what he's talking about. He's saying, yeah, when he says strongholds, everybody knows what he's talking about. When Paul said strongholds, everybody said, wow, you have a weapon to demolish a stronghold. A stronghold is a defended fortress. I guess the the best analogy I can give for all of us to remember is years ago there was the movie Troy with, with Brad Pitt in there and Eric Bana and the whole Troy behind this wall with these walls when you or if you watch Game of Thrones and 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 anybody in any city that had a wall that they could close so that they could defend to keep people out. The whole point of the dragons is that the dragons can fly above and attack within the walls, and they've got turrets and stuff on the walls to defend it. That is a stronghold. It's a fortress. It's a city that's fortified and fortress, and there's provision in it so that you can withstand an army that's besieging your city. Matter of fact, that you're supposed to have, uh, the wall is supposed to be there so that you can have enough inside and have enough supplies so that you can live out, so that you can survive longer than, a, than an army that's arrayed against you. It's a defended city. It's a defended fortress. It's... It's a stronghold. If I could just break it down for us, it's, it's industry with longevity. I, that's, I, that's how I also make it relate. We're talking about industry with longevity. We're talking about a system that has been created for certain people to thrive in it. A system that has been created to keep a certain amount of people in power and other people out. My God. A system that has been created so that there are opportunities for these people and not opportunities for these others. One of the things that is particularly interesting and wicked about white people, white men in particular, and this particular generation that has been in control, one of the challenges that black people and black Christians have had with white men in power and white men who have subjugated the world is that they have a way of being in power and keeping anyone else out of power, regardless of whether they are able or not. They'd rather have bad medicine than medicine with black people in it. They, they, they're, like, they're like folk who would rather have a team that loses with their people on the team than have a winning team. They, they want baseball without black people in it. They'd rather have a team with no black people on it and lose than have black people on the team and win. They'd rather have medicine. They'd rather die with, without a knowledge of heart surgery, then let a black man operate on their heart. It's a system that is set up for them to be successful. They'd rather be in the position unqualified than to allow 
to, than to allow a black person to let Kamala Harris in there. They'd rather, they don't care how qualified she is. They don't care what she knows. They don't care about her record. They don't care about her IQ, her education, her qualifications. There's some of them that are like, I don't care. I'd rather have an unqualified white person in the seat than a qualified person of color. Something they're going to have to answer to God for. Something that is a factor in where we are as a people, where we are even as a nation. Where could we be without racism? Where would we be as a nation without the exclusion of some of our best and brightest simply because of the color of their skin? My God, I'm supposed to be preaching. What I'm saying to you is that, that when I'm talking about a stronghold, I'm talking about something like that, industry with longevity, a system meant to keep women out, a system meant to keep black people out, a system meant to keep Mexicans out, the, uh, 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 a system meant to keep the disenfranchised, uh, a system meant to keep poor people in their place and wealthy people in their place, a system that is meant to keep this group in power and this group out. That's a stronghold. That's a stronghold. Who am I preaching to this morning? That's a stronghold. When I think of a stronghold, especially when I start to look at Jericho, I see a stronghold as the first domino to possession. When we're looking at Jericho as a stronghold, Jericho is the first domino to be knocked over for the conquest of Canaan. For many of us, the stronghold is the first domino to us really taking possession. For some of us, the, do the first domino was getting out the house, getting out of that town, getting out from under the authority of people that are trying to keep us down, trying to get away from your abusive spouse, your abusive husband, your abusive wife, your abusive situation, your abusive uncle. Your abu the first domino was getting past whatever the system was to keep you down. For some of us, the first domino to fall on our path to possession was getting that degree, <laughs> was getting that, was, was graduating from college, was, for some of us, the first, the stronghold is, what is the first fortress you have to defeat for you to get to where you know God is calling you to be? That's a stronghold. The first domino to possession. The first thing that falls down, and after that falls down, you start, you take off. After that goes down, you go to another level. After that goes down, you just take off. You, you had a whole nother level. You, you were shy, you were quiet, but after you met that first person, you, when you spoke to people the first time, and you realized that your judgment of people was wrong and your fear of people was unfounded. Now you got all kinds of friends because that was a stronghold and it was the first domino to go down to possession. I got one more. <laughs> I got one more. When I say stronghold, I mean a battle for property. <laughs> uh, Jericho is a battle. Canaan is a battle for property. We talk about Canaan as if it's just a battle for spirituality, but I would contend that Jericho is a battle, that Canaan is a battle for possession and property in the land. And Jericho, which was a stronghold, was the beginning of a battle for property. Now, we could talk a whole lot, but do we have stronghold power? I, listen, we could be upset, but do we have stronghold power? What does it take for us to demolish the stronghold? A few weeks ago, I was having a conversation with, my, with one of my baby sisters. All of my sisters are baby sisters. But she just, she just wanted to talk about, about the, this most recent Young man shot in the back and paralyzed, and, and the, the Jacob Black and a whole and Breonna Taylor, and she just wanted to talk. She just she said to me, "I just, 
She said, she said, I just need to hear my big brother's voice. I just need to talk to you. I just, can you tell me something? Can you, how are you handling it? How do you look at the videos? How, how is it? How can you see a young white man fully armed with an automatic rifle coming at police and tackled and a black man running away with a, with a knife in his pocket, shot in the back seven times? She said, how do you handle it? I said, sweetheart, if it had not been for the Lord, if it had not been for God, it takes Christ for me to deal with the bitterness that is the life of an African American. I read a quote that's from James Baldwin that said, being an African-American is basically being an, an African with no memory and, a, and an American with no privilege. <laughs> an African with no history, an American with no, with no property, an African with no family generational understanding, and an American without rights. How do I do it? I, I, I don't know, but I know in whom I believed and I'm persuaded that he's able. And after all the protests are done, and after, I'm so glad for the, for the NBA boycott they did a couple of weeks ago. Listen, uh, hallelujah. Uh, uh, amen for it. We're going to have to do it. But at some point, we're also going to have to take a step back and say, okay, now what do we own? What's our property? And do we have stronghold power? What we are battling against, hey, black Christians, what we're battling against is stronghold. <laughs> this is a stronghold. This, this, is, this is a fortress. This is a system meant to keep us in our place as slaves. This, we are talking about a stronghold. And what we need is stronghold power. Praise God for the protest, but we need stronghold power. We're, praise God for what we're doing, and praise God for what we've done before. Hallelujah for it. But at this point, in this new day, in this new season, we need a new power. And that new power is stronghold power. I think I've made my point. Let me move forward. Because it's why I looked at Joshua 6, because Jericho was a stronghold. Jericho was a stronghold. I know we could talk about Jericho in all kinds of types, and, but if we just look at it in the reality of what it was, in their day, in this battle, for this moment, for them to take possession of Canaan, Joshua fighting this battle, Jericho was a stronghold. Well, all of us that went to Sunday school, we were all taught about Jericho. Around the walls of Jericho, the army went. Around the walls of Jericho, around the walls of Jericho. <laughs> when the people gave a shout, the walls went flat. Why were we taught that? We were taught that it's in us. When I say Jericho, almost all of us know what I'm talking about. When I say Joshua, Joshua put the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. They taught it to us. If you was in Sunday school, they taught it to us. What were they teaching us? They were teaching us that you have access to stronghold power. They were teaching us, oh, you don't have to ever worry about a stronghold, that we have divine power to demolish strongholds. I need somebody to say something to me in the comments right there. Who am I talking to? Somebody's facing a stronghold. I want you to know we have stronghold power. Black people are facing a stronghold. We have stronghold power. What can we do? Well, black Christian, black Christians, we dealing with a stronghold. What can we do to fight against stronghold power? Jericho was a stronghold. You're saying the weapons we fight with, PA, are, the, are not the weapons of this world. They have divine power. That's right. They have the power to pull down strongholds. And it causes me to ask a question. And that question is, what was the weapon they used to demolish that stronghold? 
What was the weapon that they used? We just finished reading it. We read it at the beginning of the presentation this morning. What was the weapon that they used to demolish the stronghold? There's all kinds of weapons in there that I can mention. But just for this particular presentation, can I suggest to you one of the weapons that they used to not to, to access stronghold power? And that weapon is agreement. Agreement. Agreement is power. Matter of fact, agreement is anointed. The psalm says, behold, how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It's like the anointing. It is like the oil that is poured upon the head. Agreement is anointed. Agreement. Agreement is anointed. Agreement is powerful. God could have knocked these walls down with anything. God could have said to Joshua, go up there and speak to the walls. He could have said, go up there and kick the wall. He could have said, go up there and blow on the wall. He could have said, Joshua, you go there yourself and write Jehovah on the wall and I'll knock the walls down. But that's not what he did. He said, I want you to get the people together and I want you to get them in agreement. I want everybody to march around it and on the set for the six days, march around it. For, and on the seventh day, get everybody to march around it seven times. And on the seventh time, blow the trumpet, get everybody in the army to shout and the walls will come down. We don't even really think about Joshua's discussion and what Joshua had to say. We don't think about the people that were like, we, we, we're going, what? March around the city six times? And then what? what on the seventh day, what? Seven times. And then what? Shout. And God said, what? We don't, we don't think about it. We just take the story for granted. But we have to realize that, yeah, God is saying, yeah, I want to see can I get y'all to agree? Because agreement has that kind of power. The thing about agreement is that agreement is difficult to achieve. I'm just throwing these ideas. Agreement is difficult to achieve. Agreement's great, but agreement is difficult to achieve. And a part of the reason why agreement is difficult to, to achieve is because agreement is dependent upon communication. Agreement is dependent upon communication. <laughs> it's dependent on communication. Agreement is powerful. Agreement is anointed. But we all know, black people especially, we know that agreement is hard for us to achieve. It's hard enough just to get black people to come together. It's hard enough just to get black Christians to come together. Parties know how to play us against one another. They know how to put a black face up in front of us just to peel enough of the black people off so that we won't be in agreement with one another. One of the reasons why we're under the boot and unable to overcome the stronghold is because it's just difficult to achieve agreement. Agreement is difficult to achieve. And a part of the reason why that is is because agreement is dependent upon, com upon communication. And if we're going to access agreement and access this stronghold power, then we're going to have to tackle the challenges and tackle the stuff that stops us from being able to agree. This doesn't just apply to America or the world or the nation or the church or black. It applies to family. It applies to your marriage. I'm trying to tell you right now, a marriage with agreement in it, is way more powerful than a marriage without agreement in it. Matter of fact, you can have a couple together that's not saved. And if an unsaved heathen couple agrees, <laughs> and you put a couple together that loves Jesus, but they don't agree, I would contend that the heathen couple with agreement will have more power than the saved couple that don't. A cult with agreement can have more power than a church that can agree. Agreement is powerful, but agreement is difficult to achieve. Therefore, there are barriers, and the Lord has given me these seven barriers to effective communication and ultimately to agreement. Seven barriers to communication, seven barriers to agreement. 
I've preached something like this before, but actually I, it's very different. This Lord is saying something totally different to me at this point in, in my 50s. And so bear with me if you've, but, but seven barriers to effective communication. And because they're barriers to communication, ultimately they're barriers to agreement. Let me give you the seven. The first one, number one, is obvious, and it's gender. Gender. Men and women don't see the world the same way. Men and women don't communicate the same way. Men and women don't see the world the same way. I know right now we live in a system that's trying so hard to make men and women exactly the same. But viva la difference. We're not the same. How men see the world and how women see the world is not the same. When I, when I counsel couples, I'm trying to communicate to them and I'm trying to get them to see that. Yeah, when, 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 when you're talking, what I'm listening for is what your needs are. And men have different needs than women. And women have different needs than men. And, and so you don't communicate the same way and it becomes a barrier to your ability to agree. Gender is a barrier. Gender is... And the difference between men and women is a barrier to communication and therefore a barrier to agreement. You ever try to talk to a woman? My God. You ever try to talk to a man? You ever try to listen to a woman's story? You ever try to listen to a man's story? They're just not the same. Women give more details. Women are, are, have a tendency to be more articulate. It's just... That they're more connected to their emotions and feelings. It's, it's just different. And it can become a barrier to communication and therefore a barrier to your ability to agree. I got run out of time. What's the second barrier to communication and, and agreement? The second one is, is uh, next to gender. I would say the next one is culture. Culture. Part of what makes America such a challenge is all the different cultures that are represented here. Oh, well, they don't, they don't have these problems in Korea. Of course they don't have those problems in Korea because everybody in Korea is Korean. <laughs> well, when you have a, a place, a world, a system where 99.99.99% of the people in China are Chinese, so when you, when you have that system, whereas when you're in a system, when you're in a world with multiple cultures in it, it's a part of what makes our political system a part of the reason why our country has a tendency to be so divided. One of the reasons why this election is so pivotal, but if you've looked at the last five to seven elections, the the results have been close. It just shows how divided we are as a nation. And a part of the reason that, that why that is is because uh, when you're from different cultures, you communicate different. Different things are important to you. Right now, we're just trying to simply get everyone to say in America that black lives matter. It's easy for us to say it who are black. We're just trying to say that black lives matter. There are some people who are unable to just simply say it. What is that about? That's just about a difference in culture. That's about the fact that they were raised in a systemic racial culture and for them to admit that black lives matter goes against their cultural upbringing. Culture is a, is a divide, in America in particular, but in the world. When we try to come together in the United Nations, it's so interesting, for the United Nations to come together and have a conversation for peace treaties to be made, for, for there to be a World Health Organization. The World Health Organization is supposed to be thinking about the, the health of the world because the world is so connected now. You can't just think about American health. you got to think about what's going on in China because it's easy for a disease to spread as we now see. To have a governmental leader that says, well, I just care about my nation, doesn't get it, doesn't understand. I know it's hard. I know it's easy. I know that's what you want to say because to stretch yourself to understand other cultures, that to do that is hard work, but... Uh, we're not going to be able to agree, and we won't have 
demolishing, stronghold demolishing power if we can't agree together. And culture is a barrier. Number three, the third barrier to communication and agreement is class. Class. A part of, of the challenge in the world agreeing, a part of the challenge in almost any nation agreeing is that the people who are in the top 1% or the top 10%, the people who have been successful, the people that have gone to a whole nother level, the people who have their own business or the people that make a certain amount of money, they live a different kind of life, they have a different kind of communication, they have a different kind of talk, they see the world in a different way. And when they try to communicate with someone who doesn't see the world the way they see it in that way, then it just becomes divisive. It just, it's, it's hard to agree. Right now, what a person that's got $25 million in the bank is thinking and what a person that's got $25 in the bank is thinking is two totally different things. They're just, they're just in different classes. I know I'm not, thanks be to God as a result of his hand on my life and the gifts he's given me and, 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 and even you all and, and the world and the ministry. I, when I fly, I fly first class. I don't think of it even as first class. Although it's first class, I don't think of it as class. But it's class. The world has a way of being divided up by class. So you have first class, you have upper class, you have middle class, you have lower class. We're dealing in America with the loss of the middle class. And what the middle class worker is looking for in a leader and what a top 1% earner is looking for in a leader and what someone who's on welfare is looking for in a leader, those are very different things. <laughs> and they make it difficult to agree. Who am I talking to? They make it difficult. So class ends up being a barrier to communication and ultimately a, a barrier to agreement. I was having a conversation with one of my sons and uh, one of my spiritual sons, and, and I was suggesting something for him to do. I was like, yeah, what I want you to do is I want you to go to Texas. His wife, I said, I want you to go to Texas. Yeah, I know she's there, but I want you to go to Texas and see her. I want you to go and surprise her. And he was like, okay. I said, I want you to look it up and see how much the tickets cost and then and, and let me know. He said, all right. And he, he said, uh, I said, no, I want you to let me know. I said, and when I say let me know, I mean I'll help you. So when he called me back. And I, and, I, and I said, what, what does it look like? He said, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it because it just, it's expensive. I said, oh, yeah, what's expensive? And when he said the number to me, I said, yeah, it's okay. Well, let's go. I'm going to you need to go. Because what's expensive to me and what's expensive to him is not the same. Class is a barrier. Number four, anybody hearing a word from the Lord? Number four, the fourth barrier to communication and therefore agreement is generation. I don't even have to hardly talk about this, but the generational differences, it's just a, it's a barrier. We're from a different generation. I'm from a general. I started off this whole, this whole sermon talking about Run DMC. Some of y'all know, there's some of you that don't know, that don't know who Run DMC is. You know Reverend Run from his little corny stuff, but you don't know Run DMC. You don't, you don't even know that there's some of you, I, I one of my sons, my spiritual sons, he didn't even know Ice Cube was a rapper. I said, yeah, Ice Cube's a rapper. Before he, was a, before he was an actor, he was a rapper. I had to play him an original, once upon a time in the projects. Yo, nah, nah, nah. I had to play them because we're communicating from different generations. In my prayer this morning, I, I was talking about, Lord, get us in the, get us in the, get our antenna up. I know there's a whole lot of you that are like an, 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 an antenna. What exactly is an antenna? Because you weren't, you weren't around during antennas. But there's a whole lot of us that remember when the TV had an antenna. When the antenna broke off uh, and you put a head, you had to put a wire hanger on that. Uh, you, uh, we remembered the two channels. It's just a different world. 
My brother hooked me up with this, with this Amazon Fire Stick account thing where I can watch whatever I want. And they had Love Boat on there. And I said, oh, my God, Love Boat. I know the song, love, exciting and new. Come aboard, we're expecting you, Love Boat. Some of y'all don't know nothing about the Love Boat. What is it? Because we're from different generations. You look at this gray hair, and you see this old man up here, and I'm looking at you, and you're looking at me like, what is that? I still have an iPod. My, as a matter of fact, I still have two iPods. My, my kids look at me like I'm crazy. Dad, just listen through your phone. And I'm like, you better get out of here with that iTunes account. I know I don't need no Apple iTunes. I got all the music I want in my iPod. It, what is it? It is a difference in generation. My daddy talking about 8-track tapes, and I'm talking about iPods, and y'all are on your way to be able to play a music through your finger. Well, Dad, if you, I can hear it now. Grandpa, all you have to do is get your disco music on there. Hey, you, listen, listen to me, disco. All you have to do is get your gospel music on this finger, your contemporary worship on this finger, your rap music on this finger, and all I have to do is just take this finger, and if I point it in the middle of my head, then I can hear all the beyond. I'll say I want. That, and, and, and you know what I'm going to say? I'm going to say, yeah, I don't trust that. Where's my iPod? Where is my earbuds with the wire? What are we talking about? We're talking about generations. We're talking about a different generational perspective. One of the problems with America is that we have, it's just a challenge, even to our agreement, is we have four generations that are occupying the same space at the same time. The people running for president are boomers. This gray hair right here, this is an Xer. <laughs> then you got millennials that are in their 30s, rolling on 40s, and now you got the Z generation. My sons can vote right now. Kids in their 20s. You have four generations with four generational perspectives, and their inability to communicate with one another makes agreement even more difficult. I don't know if you've ever been talking to someone from another generation and you just you're just like, okay, just never mind. All right, just, all right, never mind. Every now and then I'm having a conversation with Pastor Manny or Pastor Brian, and, and they're trying to talk to me, and I'm just, I'm just like, all right, guys, I got to go. And they're like, all right, Pop, talk to you later. Because we just, we have reached a place where they are talking from a millennial perspective, and if we talk too much longer, I'm going to say, that's what's wrong with y'all millennials. And they're going to say, and that's what's wrong with y'all Xers. Generation is a difference. My God, I'm out of time. Let me, let me, I want to keep giving to you. I got three more. Can I give you three more? The, the fifth, the fifth barrier to communication and therefore agreement is education. Education. If I'm educated on another level than you, then I have thoughts that you don't have. I have an understanding that you don't have. I've read things you haven't read. There's a perspective. One of the reasons why education was denied black people is because education is empowering. But if we're at different education levels, almost impossible for us to agree with one another. Man, I'm going to have to preach all. I'm going to have to preach this again. This is not going to be the last time because I'm just, I'm, I'm running out of time and I want to give you all seven and I don't, and I'm not really, I don't have the time to really break them all down. But education is, is, is a barrier to, to communication and agreement. Number six is experience. What I've experienced and what you've experienced, your experiences make you different. My experiences make me different. We start talking, and you start speaking from your experience, and then I start speaking from my experience, and then we end up communicating in a different way because someone that's been to war and been and had the experience of seeing friends killed, and uh, they are a different person, and they have a different perspective, and it can be almost difficult to agree with that person. Someone that has been abused, someone that has been raped, someone that has been molested, someone that has been hurt. Very often, someone who is a victim of abuse has a tendency to automatically agree with an accuser who is saying they've been abused. Now, I totally understand it. I can't be critical of it. 
because they've been abused and they identify with the person because of what they've experienced. When we go to try to communicate, it becomes difficult because their experience has changed them. Now when it comes time to agree, it's very difficult to agree because we've had different experiences. And then number seven is spirituality. <laughs> we, if I'm spiritual and you're not, we see the world in a very different way. I have a lot of conversations. It's my job. It's my life to have conversations with people that just aren't spiritual enough to see what I see. They're not saved enough to hear what I'm saying. They judge what I'm saying in a carnal way because what I'm saying to them is spiritual words that have to be discerned spiritually and they don't have enough Holy Ghost to understand what I'm saying. They don't have enough spiritual, they don't have enough of a prayer life to have a conversation with me about that. And very often I just end up just saying, oh, it's okay. And I end up, now, I don't know if you've ever been there where you just say, hey, it's okay. Because I see that the wrestle's not against flesh and blood, angels and principalities and powers. I've been on a kick where I, I've been preaching and talking, and, I, and I've, been, I've said it from this pulpit, and I'm saying it again, that your mouth has power. Death and life is in the power of your mouth. Death and life is in the power of your tongue. And there's a whole, I'll get into conversations with people who they're telling me what their situation is. And I just start shaking my head and they're like, what? And I'm like, well, the only reason why you're that way is because that's what you say. And they just look at me like I'm, I'm crazy or biased or whatever. And I'm saying, well, I'm sorry, but the reason why we can't communicate and can't agree is because you're not spiritual enough to get this. And we have a hard time communicating because you're not spiritual enough to discern this. And if you start multiplying that, if I'm at a different generation, and I'm at a different level of education, and I'm at a, at a different class, and I'm, in a, I'm of a different culture, and I'm of a different spirituality, it can be even more difficult for you to actually have a conversation with me. So we, we're dealing with the challenge of agreement. I know I'm out of time, but I, I've got a final question, and that is how do we agree? What's the Jericho stronghold agreement model? I'll give you the three, and, I'll, and I'm done. The three is vision, confession, and sacrifice. Vision. Confession, speech, and sacrifice. My God. Vision, confession, and sacrifice. They had a vision to take Jericho. They all said the same thing at the same time. And they sacrificed. Because they said that Jericho belongs to God. They didn't take any spoils from Jericho. That their ability to have a vision of what they can take and to get their mouth together to say the same thing and then to sacrifice. It is a, a, it is a unifying force that empowered them to have stronghold power. I want to believe with you right now that you will have divine power to demolish strongholds. Strongholds will no longer be something that you can't get past. That the power of God, divine power, and in particular, agreement power, will give you an ability that you've never had before in your life. Let me pray for you. Lord, I just thank you right now for stronghold power. God, I thank you right now for agreement power. God, I thank you right now for an anointing on all of us that destroys the yoke. In the name of Jesus. Can I get you to give? Can I get you to sacrifice? It's a way for us to agree together. My God, it's a way for us to agree together. I've been getting everybody to sow. Just sow into the sermon that they heard. And so right now, I, when I don't want to spend a whole lot of time doing it. We're all used to it at this point. But just you can pull up your push bay. Woe online. 
to 77977. I've been asking everybody to give at least $50 above their tithes and offerings. And it's a way for us to agree together. Part of the way that we agree together is through the tithe and the offering. Whenever anyone starts to argue with me about tithing, I, I, I just simply say, I, I mean, I hear you. But, but in the church, the tithe, the tenth is a way for us to agree. It's not equal gifts, it's equal sacrifice. We're all giving the same percentage. What is that? It makes us agree together. In the same way, let's agree together right now. Let's sow into the word that we heard. I know there are many of us that are facing strongholds. There are many of us that are facing the battle of agreement. I want to empower you right now. I want the anointing of God to be on you for you to access stronghold power. And a part of the way you do that is you sow into a word you heard. Can I get you to do that? If you've never given before, then if you just text WO online 77977, then a one-time registration will pop up for push pay. And you, you put your card in. You'll never have to do it again. It's secure. And from now on, you'll be able to give to the work of the kingdom of God. I dare you. I double dog dare you to sow into a word you heard. Say, wow, I heard that. I'm going to sow into it. I heard that. Now I'm going to give to it. I heard that. Now I'm going to do something. There's an action that I'm going to take. And as a result of that, I'm going to see that thing come alive in my life. Can I get you to give? At least $50. If $50 is nothing to you, then I want you to give a denomination of 50. If 50 is way too much for you, if you're like, oh my God, I don't even have $50, then $5. Whatever God lays on your heart, word says each person should give as they've decided in their heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Come on, I'm not going to beg. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, I thank you right now for this sermon, God. They begin, this, this beginning thought, because God, we, we barely got to really talk about it fully just because of time. But God, I thank you for agreement power. I thank you for stronghold power. I thank you right now that no weapon formed against us can ever prosper. That we may be facing Jericho's. But we are able to shout and knock them down. We are able to sow and knock them down. We're able to worship and knock them down. We're able to give in faith and knock them down. God, take this offering that we're giving right now and multiply it supernaturally. God, I say that every time. Multiply it supernaturally to the power of the giver and to the upbuilding of your kingdom. And we're giving in faith, believing you for something to happen this week. In the name of Jesus. We all said together, amen. So glad you're with us today. I trust you heard a word from the Lord. I trust you sensed the power of God. I trust you worship with us this morning. I trust you gave. I trust that you lifted up holy hands. I trust this wasn't just a show for you. I trust that you actually gave to the work and that you actually participated with us. And we're so glad that you were with us today. So glad we were with you today. Hallelujah. And we want to see you again. See you next Sunday. Come on, tell somebody. See you next Sunday. We're here on Sundays, 9 and 1130. And then on Wednesday nights, we have this. Uh, on Wednesday nights, I've been sharing devotional Bible study right from my house. My God. My wife don't hardly let me leave and go nowhere. She let me come here on Sunday mornings to preach. And then I got to get right back in my car. Even though I got a coronavirus test the other day, doctor made me get one just because of all the people I'm exposed to. And I'm negative. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. But, but, but what I'm saying to you is on Wednesday nights, we're right there. We're sharing devotional. It's been powerful. You can come and you can be a part of that. You can share this with somebody. And you could be a part of what God is doing in the earth right now. If you're interested in being a member, you could just type member in the comments. Somebody will reach out to you. Because at this point, our membership is expanding literally around the world. And you could be a part of what God is doing in us and through us. Come on, let's pray one more time. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord God, for our time together. Thank you. Thank you for your word that's in our lives. Thank you. Thank you for your anointing that destroys the yoke. Thank you. Thank you for your power that's available to us. Now, God, you've made the heavens and the earth by your great power. Nothing is too difficult for you. Stretch forth your hand to heal. Perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Consider their threatenings and do a work in our lives. 
God, as we always pray. Bless your people. Make your face shine upon your people. Be gracious to your people. Favor on your people. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight. For God, you're our rock. You're our redeemer. We love you. In Jesus' name, we all sit together. Amen. God bless you. See you next time.